Tonight on The Best Times, we examine the range of services provided by the Community Legal Center. You'll meet a famous Memphian who was a contemporary of Amelia Earhart. And we'll help you understand COPD. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. For the past four years on this show, we've focused on the issue of elder abuse and the efforts of the Coordinated Response to Elder Abuse Team in identifying cases of abuse and finding solutions to the problems. One of the partners in Korea is the Community Legal Center, a nonprofit organization that is in the forefront of fighting legal battles in cases of elder abuse and more. To find out more about the services provided by the Community Legal Center, I spoke with the head of their elder law program. Let's begin by talking about uh, the mission of the Community Legal Center. What is your mission? Uh, our mission is to provide uh, general civil legal services to the underserved populations of Memphis, whether that be um, uh, low income people, immigrants, or the elderly. Uh, we try to serve the underserved. How great is the need here in the Memphis area for uh, organizations like yours? Uh, the need in Memphis and Shelby County is quite great. Uh, as most people do know, Memphis has a uh, somewhat of a problem with poverty. And most people within their lifetime are, go are going to have at least one to four civil legal needs uh, in their lifetime. And imagine if you had to face that without an attorney. Which is a, that's a surprising statistic. I, I think it is for a lot of people. People don't think about these things uh, as a, you know, needing legal services. But if you have a problem with your landlord, if you want a divorce, mm -hmm. uh, you know, each of these things are, uh, you know, if you don't have the money for it, that's a barrier for you to receive uh, a legal benefit that you really need when heading to court. Uh, you, you offer several different programs, so let's just talk about those programs. What, what programs do you have? Uh, well, we have our, uh, our original program, which is General Civil Legal Services, and that can be anything from landlord-tenant, divorce, uh, contract issues, things of that nature. We have expanded, and it is almost half of what we offer now is our, Im our immigration services. Uh, and then we also have our uh, elder law program, which is, focuses on elder abuse. Oh, well, let's talk about a couple of those. Let's talk about uh, the immigration services that you offer, because as you indicated, um, over half of your work now is involving immigration uh, issues. Correct, almost, almost half of it uh, focuses on immigration issues. Uh, which shows how much of a burgeoning problem this is. It is only going to increase. Uh, we do focus on uh, things such as U visas, asylum, uh, special immigrant juvenile status, which are a lot of different terms, mm -hmm. but uh, essentially it's you know people fleeing violence, uh, people who have been the victims of crime, and children and we help navigate them through the immigration system, which also overlaps into civil legal, you know, people to uh, become documented here in the United States must also cross several civil legal hurdles as well as immigration legal hur hurdles. All right, let's talk about the elder law program. Uh, specifically, I know that you're involved with um, the coordinated response to elder abuse team, which we've discussed many times here on this show. 
uh, the issue of elder abuse. What is your role in CREA? Uh, I am one of the civil legal uh, service providers for seniors. Uh, now what that typically looks like, uh, while sometimes we do assist seniors with uh, completing powers of attorney and things to set themselves up in a position where they would not be abused, unfortunately by the time they get to us, they are in the middle of a crisis. Very often what that looks like is someone with mild to severe dementia who is being taken, taken advantage of by very often and more likely someone in their family, someone that they know, someone in the neighborhood. Are we talking there primarily financial abuse? Uh, financial abuse does touch on most of these okay. situations, um, but it's, it's medical neglect. Uh, very often. It's going in and acting like you're the person who's going to be assisting this senior with what they need, but what is really happening is that they're being taken advantage of. Uh, unfortunately, if that senior citizen has dementia and has progressed to a state where um, they are no longer able to make decisions for themselves, it's my job to go in and seek a conservatorship of them and put someone in place, uh, or the courts put someone in place who uh, has the legal authority and is fit, willing, and able to make those decisions for the senior. Uh, sometimes that is a trusted family f uh, member that we hope we can find somebody, uh, but oftentimes that can be the public uh, district uh, conservator with the aging commission, who is another partner in the coordinated response to elder abuse. How serious is the problem of elder abuse in this area? It is, it is quite serious. Uh, it's estimated that only one in 10 incidences of elder abuse uh, is, is reported. So we know that it's an underreported crime. And, you know, and it is a crime. I, I think people often don't see it that way because maybe it's family. And you know, maybe mom and dad always indulged a little anyway, but you know, now we're talking about a senior who needs everything that, you know, all of their income needs to be devoted to them and, and, and all of the resources need to be devoted to them. And uh, they're all complicated issues. They, they require services from a number of different uh, of our partners across Shelby County. Speaking of partners, because uh, for four plus years now, I guess, the coordinated response to elder abuse team has been working together. Many different organizations Correct. all working together, and you're a part of it. Um, from your viewpoint, is it working? Uh, are you achieving some success? We are achieving success, and we're achieving it on a national level. Uh, what we're doing here in Shelby County, uh, we are trying to put it into a program that can be replicated across the United States. We can send trainers out and show other uh, cities and counties how that they can do what we're doing here in Shelby County because we are being recognized on a national level. People are talking about us. People are looking at us and saying, uh, things are working. Let, let's see what they're doing here in Shelby County. Let's talk about the future to close things out. Uh, Memphis is a poor city. Uh, we have an immigrant population that is probably only going to grow in the coming years. We also have a, a, a baby boom population that's going to age. So what does the future look like to you as you sit there at the Community Legal Center? Uh, the future of the Community Legal Center uh it only looks like we will be growing. Uh, you know, 25 years ago when we started, it was a part-time attorney who would process some clients who came into a clinic and we would uh, refer them out to private attorneys who agreed to represent them pro bono. Now we have, you know, five full-time attorneys working on legal issues. Um, you know, the, the community legal center is only going to grow as these needs grow um, and we'll be looking at all different sorts of sources for funding. We, we get our monies from uh, a number of different places and um, including the Shelby County government who now uh, provides for my position um, as an essential service. So I, I think that the fact that Shelby County government is recognizing that what we do for the elder law program is an essential service here in Shelby County uh, only speaks to the fact that everybody's starting to recognize that these problems are only going to expand, especially in a city 
that has uh, a poverty issue. Well, let's hope we can address those problems in the future. Uh, thank you very much for being on The Best Times talking about uh, the Community Legal Center. All right, thank you. To find out more about the services provided by the Community Legal Center, visit their website or contact them directly. Memphis has produced its share of famous people in the last 200 years, but chances are you've never heard of Phoebe Fairgrave Amelie. She was the first woman in America to hold a civilian pilot's license and was a friend and confidant of Amelia Earhart. Historian Janan Sherman spent 17 years researching and writing the biography of Phoebe Amelie, a woman who spent her life walking on air. Phoebe Amelie was born in 1902 and right out of high school decided she wanted to fly, figured out a way to get her hands on an airplane and taught herself to do stunts, hoping to sell them to the movies. Phoebe Fairgrave was still a teenager in 1921 when she met World War I veteran Vernon Amelie. He was the only pilot at the airport willing to teach a woman how to fly. They teamed up to fly stunts for movies and go barnstorming across the Midwest, with Phoebe dancing atop the wing of Vernon's plane. She was both brave and very determined about what she wanted to do. But it was scary times, you know, there weren't any safety belts or, you know, no gear of any kind. She, she put um, suction cups on the bottom of her sneakers in order to help her keep her, her footing on the wings. It was not very good life expectancy for that sort of work. Plus, it didn't pay worth a hoot. Again, in Vernon's logbook, he's keeping track of money in and money out. And sometimes they didn't clear 10 bucks for a month. The 1922 flying season ended at the Mid-South Fair in Memphis, and so did Phoebe's barnstorming career. Phoebe and Vernon had to pawn their luggage to get enough money to pay their hotel bill. They had gotten married earlier that year, and Vernon felt that Memphis offered good opportunities, so they settled here. By 1926, they had teamed with other air enthusiasts to open Memphis's first airport. Vernon and Phoebe established Mid-South Airways, offering flying lessons, cargo transport, crop dusting, and airplane sales. And they're trying to, to build a legitimate business. What really helps them, actually, is the flood of 1927. But now this is a way to establish a useful legitimacy. And they were flying the mail from Little Rock. They were picking up people stranded on sandbars. They were bringing in medicine. This was really, really dangerous work. And all of a sudden, people start rethinking about what this flying stuff's all about. That same year, the world's most famous aviator stopped in Memphis on his cross-country celebratory tour promoting aviation. Within two years of that visit, Memphis opened its first municipal airport with Vernon Omley as manager. In 1928, Phoebe became the first woman to enter the Ford Reliability Tour, a 6,000-mile cross-country exhibition of aviation safety. She flew alone. She refused to take anybody, including a navigator, because she said, if there's a man along, they'll think he did all the flying. So I'm going alone. And so she does, and becomes the first woman to fly over the Rocky Mountains in a small plane, over the Great American Desert, as they called it in those days. It was very risky stuff. The late 20s and early 30s was the heyday for air racing in America. The National Air Race of 1929 marked the first time women were allowed to compete. Phoebe flew alongside 20 other women, including Amelia Earhart and she won her class. After the 1929 event, Phoebe became one of the founders of the 99s, the first organization of female pilots in the country. Amelia Earhart was elected as the organization's first president. She and Amelia were, were probably as close as anybody was to Amelia. Poor Amelia. She was married to G.P. Putnam, who was a big PR guy. And he just made sure she had the latest, greatest, largest, fastest airplanes, but never was enough time to get checked out in them, 
never was enough time to really learn how to fly him. In 1937, Amelia was planning her fateful around the world flight when Phoebe paid her a visit. She was very, very concerned about Amelia in that last trip Amelia made to the point where she went to Miami the night before Amelia took off and said, don't do it. Phoebe's greatest air racing success came in 1931 when the national air races allowed women to compete in a handicapped format against men. She beat a field of 63 entrants, including 46 men, to take the title. And that was big, that was really big. She was national news everywhere when she won that. And it came with a big purse, but mostly what she won was a publicity. And it's Eleanor Roosevelt who sends her a telegram and said, I'd like you to consider campaigning for my husband who's running for president in 1932. And so she does. Phoebe flew around the country campaigning for Roosevelt. Her work and her friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt earned her a political appointment in the new administration. In 1933, Phoebe became the first woman to hold an executive job in federal aeronautics. But the transition to a desk job wasn't an easy one. It was a difficult position to be in. Um, she wasn't trained as a bureaucrat, she was a pilot. A woman in a man's world, all of those sorts of things were very difficult. Still, one of the things that surprised me that I found in the evidence is that her expertise was very much um, valued and she in fact worked really closely with engineers at Langley Field in, in aircraft design, in safety features and that sort of thing. They really paid attention to her. Unfortunately, it didn't take Phoebe long to hit the glass ceiling. The only way she thought she could challenge that was just to be as competent as she could, to demonstrate that she could do this job and do it well. But it's, it's very frustrating when it's not recognized. In 1936, Vernon died in a plane crash as a passenger aboard a commercial flight. After his death, Phoebe stopped flying. She remained a bureaucrat throughout the war years, but became disillusioned with the Truman administration and its negative attitude towards civil aviation. In January of 1952, frustrated and embittered, Phoebe resigned from government and walked away from aviation altogether. She becomes extremely right-wing. I mean, she goes way over to what would now be the Tea Party. At those days, it was the John Birch Society. I mean, the Tea Party and the ultra-right is not a new phenomenon in America. It goes, it just has different names. But she becomes very much enamored by that and, and ends up sort of devoting her last years to fighting those kinds of fights. The last 20 years of Phoebe's life are almost a mystery as she becomes increasingly obsessed with anti-communism, states' rights issues, and right-wing politics. For about 12 years, she just traveled from place to place. She would stay with old aviation friends. She would stop in a town and put an ad in the paper to be a companion for elderly ladies and do lighthouse work. And she would just keep moving. She finally ends up in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1970 and she dies five years later in a flea bag hotel, the kind of place where you keep your milk on the windowsill to keep it cool. And it's very, very, very sad. Completely alone, completely estranged, broke, victim of lung cancer, poverty. What a sad end. Phoebe Omley was buried alongside her husband Vernon here in Memphis at Forest Hill Cemetery. One obituary writer wrote, without a plane, she was like a bird with a broken wing. Our lungs provide us with life-giving air, but 30 million Americans suffer from a disease that makes every breath a struggle. COPD is a debilitating combination of three pulmonary diseases. Here in Tennessee, 9.4% of adults have been diagnosed with COPD, one of the highest incidences in the southeastern United States. And it comes at a price. Statewide, the annual cost for treatment is $794 million. And 
there is no cure. Let's find out more about COPD. What is COPD? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So it incorporates three different disease. Uh, chronic bronchitis, which basically presents with cough and sputum continuously. Uh, emphysema, which I say like where there's a destruction of terminal uh, airway, the air sacs. And chronic asthma. The asthma now which doesn't respond to inhalers completely. Those are the three big things incorporated under COPD. What are the symptoms? So basic, very common symptoms is uh, shortness of breath. That's what people start with. And then cough, because a lot of these airways, when they get destroyed, they become a seat for infection. And they start secreting a lot of mucus, and the people will be coughing. Exercise limitations, that will be another thing. And there are events of other symptoms which people present with, like uh, depression, weight loss, uh, and exercise limitations, those kind of symptoms basically present. What causes COPD? So COPD basically is caused by smoking. It's active smoking or passive smoking. That's basically called COPD. Apart from that, other biomass fuels like, uh, it's like ke uh, chemicals, the farm chemicals, the any toxic gases, those can call COPD. Is age a risk factor? So COPD is very common once it goes more than 40 years of age. If you look at the whole population in the U.S., about 5% have COPD. And when you go more than 40, it goes to 10%. And I think one thing I want to insert here is COPD is now third leading cause of death due to medical reason. Mm -hmm. And the problem is it's going up. Now, heart disease used to be the number one. And now everyone is focused on heart care, everything, and the care and has been excellent, so it's going down, whereas the COPD mortality is going up. Is COPD a risk factor for other diseases? One of the most common things with COPD leads to is a lung cancer. It, the association has been found like people who have COPD have more chances of lung cancer. Now, is it because they are smoking or because uh, their individual effect, but they have more chances of lung cancer, but they have more cause of heart disease, stroke, sleep apnea, obesity, depression, exercise limitations, anxiety, weight loss, all those things can happen with the COPD. Vitamin D deficiency, chronic renal problem, yes. How is COPD diagnosed? Basically, like, so when COPD comes, it's like a clinical evaluation somebody who has shortness of breath for a period of time, which is not getting better, we start with that. Uh, there's no, and then of course the history of smoking or being exposed to smoke or other biofuels or anything, uh, that gives us like suspicion for COPD. Now there's no lab test to diagnose COPD as such, but there's something called we do lung function test. So basically what we do in lung function test is we want to see how much a person can breathe in a machine. How can COPD be managed? There are different venues of managing COPD, definitely. One is, uh, um, we'll say, is stopping smoking. That's the basic. Because once you stop smoking, some of the literature has said, like, in 10 to 15 years, your lung goes back to the person who never smoked. After that, we have got some medicines which can definitely make it better. Those medicines can bronchodilate the airway. Those medicines can also decrease the secretions, like helping with the cough. There are a couple more things, like oxygen therapy. If somebody definitely needs oxygen, then we do that. It has shown to improve the quality of life and maybe prolong life, but definitely the quality of life will go up. And then ultimately, one more thing we do in management is uh, end-of-life care because if somebody has stage four very severe COPD, they will be admitted to hospital multiple times. They will have, have to go into ventilator and outcome may not be great. So we definitely we want to talk to our patients, hey, what do you want in that case? 
For more information, go to the website of the COPD Foundation. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to Best Times at WKNO.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.